I'm at the Frogmore Plantation in Louisiana, and it's known for growing cotton. Don't nobody know my Don't nobody know my by the Natchez Indians. They were mound builders, and we have two pristine mounds on the property that date around 800 to 1000 AD. Then the French came in. Well, they occupied both sides of the Mississippi River up and through Canada until 1763. Well, that's the date of the conclusion of the French and Indian War against England, which of course England won. So at that point in our history, the French decided to use the Mississippi River as the division line. All lands that they occupied east of the river, which was just about everything except for the Atlantic colonies, they ceded over to England for winning the war. But at the same time, they occupied most all of Louisiana Purchase west of the river. Well, that became Spanish for being their ally. <clears throat> and so the, uh, the Spanish occupied Louisiana, but also the Natchez district for quite a while. They disputed the boundary line. So the first thing the Spanish did was to entice settlers to come to the Natchez district by offering a tobacco subsidy. Well, you would think Spanish subsidy, Spanish settlers. Not so. English settlers came. We want to have to remember there were no artificial fertilizers on the East Coast. Virginia, the Carolinas, even Pennsylvania started to lose fertility by this time frame. We didn't have artificial fertilizers in widespread use until the 1940s. So once they came to this area and found this rich alluvial soil here, constantly flooded, and the silt replaced, they stayed. This church, a mid-1800s plantation church, wonderfully hand-hewn on the exterior. These timbers that support this building are 43 feet solid timbers. The interior reflects about 1905. That's when the beaded boarding became popular, so you'll see the interior prior to that time would just been open studs on the walls inside. The church congregation began here at some point in the 1800s when this plantation started growing. And by 1870, after the war was over, Mr. Wade had been sent here as the overseer. Mr. Wade saw that they needed their own church building, and he helped them build their church right here on this site. Regretfully, that first one burned in 1903, and they built again, just about a half a mile on the other side of Frogmore Plantation, and St. James is still an active congregation there. Mother and Buddy and I located this church building, and she helped us restore it put it back on this site. It's all original, original pews, and um, we had a special rededication day when we did that. Everybody, you can see the photographs on each side, everybody dressed in white, and uh, we had about 50 member gospel choir that day. It was quite a day. Narrations were taken as well as the architecture. 2,200 plus narrations were taken, a former slave still alive in the 1900s. <coughs> That's what I want to share with you. They tell us what they ate what they wore, what their housing was, their work ethics. But you know, I think one of the most important things I've gleaned from this is their, re their relationships. <coughs> My first master was Master Jim Stamps, and his wife was Miss Lucindy. She was nice and soft going. Us was glad when she stayed on the plantation. Wives made a big difference. They was kind and went about amongst the slaves and looking after them. They give out food and clothes and shoes and they doctored little babies. When things went wrong, women was all the time putting me up, go tell the mistress. Well, that was true. Many, many narrations relate that the mistress was instrumental in caring for the people. But were all of them kind? No. Let me tell you what this man says. My master and miss was the meanest folks what ever lived. They weren't nothing but poor white trash. What had never had nothing in their lives. They got a little prosperous race of cotton and bought a few slaves. Me, my mammy, and daddy and us children had to clear the land up and work it. There weren't nothing on that place. Not a cow, not a hog, nothing. Not even so much as a feather from a chicken. We worked from daylight to dark, but there weren't no such thing as satisfying either the master or the missus. We never knew when we were going to be whipped. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, regretfully, you read something like that as well. Of all the hundreds I've read, they're fairly candid in telling us whether they were privileged to live with quality folks or not. But also, keep in mind the early plantations, when they were first starting and clearing this land, 
that was struggling work. There were five to seven people lived under this roof. Pole and shake construction is typical of that time period, and the ten came after the Civil War. That's the sharecropping period Lynette told you about. Now, during that time, they could tack newspapers on the wall for insulation. You see remnants of it there. Later on, wallpaper for decoration. They could whitewash the walls in lime. They used it as an insecticide, and it sanitizes the cabins. They could scatter it under the floorboards. Every so many months, they would do that. Now, in the corner is an older cotton picker sack. They range 6 to 12 feet in length. An average picking is 200 to 250 pounds a day. You had exceptional pickers that could pick up to 500 pounds of cotton. Every person I've read about that was capable of that, they were all women. Let's hear it for the ladies. <laughs> it's not always fun being number one, is it? Very hard work. This is a um, sharecropping period sack. It's probably for a child. It's very short. This was probably used up maybe to 50s and 60s. And they wore it across their chest. They dragged it behind them in the fields. They pick probably 12-hour days. Mm -hmm. Now, you don't have to drag 70, 200 pounds of cotton, but if you're on the other end of the row, it's important to get to the scale. So your timing needs to be pretty good there. Cotton is a hibiscus. If you know what um, okra is, it's in the same family, althea trees, lots of plants and flowers in the same family. As far as I can see are the cotton fields. We usually have some in the fields except for planting time, and that's what they did yesterday out there. So you have to kind of envision this as a live plant. When it was hand-picked, it would pay all its leaves on it. And what a picker wants to accomplish besides making it through the day is to reach in, and in one pull, they want to pull the cotton out and leave the burr. Now, if you left cotton, there's a little bit there. That's called goosing or cow licking. The overseer didn't care for that. It took too long to sit there and keep picking at it. So the idea is to get it all in one pull and go to the next as fast as you can. One Wonder. pound of cotton, that's 10 hours of work right there. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. nothing easy about it. I say that. I said, anyone in here smart? <laughs> if you're not smart, say yes anyway. <laughs> <Yes>. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to count to three. When I count to three, I want everyone to tell me what's on this. Okay, one, two, three. Okay. Oh, y'all smart. <laughs> okay, it's so smart. That's right, this is a whole cake. Know why I call it a whole cake? Yes. Because I'm a hook. You're on a roll now. <laughs> That's right, we used to cook it on the Oh, very good. They used to make a fire right in the fireplace. Sit down, servant, sit down. I'm surveying the Froghorn Plantation, servant, where cotton is down. king. Sit down, servant, sit down. Sit down, servant, sit down. Sit and rest a little while. Sit down, servant, sit down. Sit and rest a little while. Sit down, servant, sit down. Sit down, servant, sit down. Sit down, servant, sit down. African Americans had a tradition of jumping the broom for a wedding ceremony. Sit down, servant, sit down. Ooh. 